Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Mikey Mahenna. I'm the executive director of Afikra. I'm based in Beirut. I'm very excited that you're all on the call today. I'm very happy to introduce our spe special guest, Nisa Ari. Um, Nisa is a lecturer in art history at the Catherine G. McGovern College of the Arts at University of Houston. She studies late 19th and 20th century visual practices with a focus on artwork from the Middle East. Her research explores the relationship between culture, cultural politics and the development of art institutions, specifically in Palestine and in Turkey. She received her PhD in the History, Theory, and Criticism of Art and Architecture program at MIT. Um, Nisa, thanks so much for joining. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for this slide. It's like seeing your, your, yourself in microcosm, in PowerPoint form. And what better way to see yourself? <laughs> so let me ask you a question. You sure. are based in Houston. I presume you grew up in the US. Yeah. How did you decide that you were interested in uh, studying Palestinian art? That's the first most obvious question that I need to understand. Yeah, and I'll try to not make it as long as that process actually was to get there. Because <laughs> um, it, it would take a while, because um, it wasn't really a natural, like, I'm not Palestinian. Um, I was born in Istanbul, actually. My father is Turkish, but my mother is American. Um, so I was born in Istanbul. I spent a lot of time um, in Istanbul growing up, um, but I would still say I was, you know, really raised in the U.S. My mannerisms are very American, the way I speak, all of that. Um, and when I started uh, the PhD, I had thought I would work on art from Turkey, especially around maybe the turn of the 20th century. Um, well, actually, that's not true, sorry. <laughs> we create these myths about our narratives that you, know, you realize when you go back are not the case. Um, when I started the PhD, I wanted to look at uh, this kind of conglomerate of nonprofit art institutions that had popped up in the Middle East in the 1990s that I thought were being really, um, uh, were very much kind of the foundations of how uh, contemporary artists from the Arab world or the Middle East more broadly were starting to circulate. And I had done a lot of research at one such organization in Istanbul, which now everyone knows as SALT, um, mm -hmm. but it used to be called Platform back in 2007 when I was doing research there. Yeah. And I thought for my PhD, it would be interesting to kind of open that up and, and look at this network of institutions like Platform in Istanbul. And so I was interested in Ashkalawan in uh, Beirut, Beirut yeah. um, Townhouse Gallery in Cairo, and then Al Amal in Jerusalem. And so my first summer of the PhD, I thought, okay, I know, I, I know quite a bit about what's going on in Turkey. Let me go somewhere else that I know really nothing about. And I uh, was lucky enough to um, hit it off with Jack Persekian, who ran Al Mamo, who runs Al Mamo, and ask if I could look through their archives because I was really interested in how they moved from a gallery first to becoming a nonprofit in the 90s um, in between the intifadas. And so that's how I started in Palestine. Um, it, I could go on, but yeah. it was. Um, it was really that first summer in Jerusalem that I, I was there. I started learning about Palestine. So it was pretty late in kind of my academic career. Um, but then I just became really interested in it. And I realized that a lot of my kind of broader questions that I had about art history were uh, found kind of a really rich territory to be explored in the case of Palestine. Yeah. So I think it's, it's worth sort of uh, pivoting. That makes sense. It, it's kind of interesting that like you're, as we'll as we'll sort of reveal in, in the over the course of the discussion, it's interesting that your entry point was through sort of like institutions, yeah. these like NGO institutions. There is some irony to that, yeah. um, which I'm sure does not escape you. But um, so, can we talk a little bit about um, what you thought Palestinian art was in the early 20th century and sort of end of the 19th century, and what you have now realized it was, was there a disparity or was there just an absence of understanding? Um, <laughs> I guess, you know, what I'll say is that when I first started this project, um, I was very lucky at MIT to have advisors who were intellectually encouraging, but also very candid with me. And I was told, um, by one of my advisors that, you know, there had been several students before me who had tried to work on art in Palestine, especially from before the Nakba, before 1948, and had pretty much given up for a couple reasons. One is that 
um, they, you know, spent a summer in Palestine and came back and said, there's just not enough stuff there for me to talk about. Um, and that I found really disheartening and I found to be untrue. Um, but also that, you know, just the political situation made it so difficult to actually get your hands on research materials. Um, so I think there was the misunderstanding and I, and I shared this, um, that there wasn't really that much that coalesced around this idea of Palestinian art or some kind of nationalism before 1948. And I would still agree with that, um, but there was a lot going on. <laughs> um, and so much of my work has been to try and understand to, you know, before I ask the question of what Palestinian art was before 1948, I really wanted to start with the question of just trying to figure out like what was art practice in Palestine um, before 1948, in those decades before the Nakba, and kind of not predetermine what it was um, before I had a chance to really survey the lay of the land and see the diversity of practices that were going on. Okay, so um, for the ignorant among us, including myself, walk me through what the, the difference between the word art is and art practice. Oh, um, <laughs> it's a really, I love that question. Um, because I don't think there is, you know, when I talk about art practices, I guess I use that phrase because I'm interested in art forms that at least in, um, in kind of the canons of art history have not been deemed uh, part of, um, kind of part of a very particular hierarchy, you know, the sure. art it's history- Sure, it's not like capital, capital A art. Not, right, I always say like cap, fine arts, like capital F, capital A. But yeah. you know, art history really is a discipline that started in Europe. And because of that, the forms that it attends to tend to be things like painting, photography, sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, and I started to find myself very interested in this project and other types of art practice or people making work um, that was not part of those set of forms. So things like, like, like textiles and like textiles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like olive wood carving, um, things that people often describe as handicrafts or crafts work. Yeah. Um, but what I was finding was that in Palestine in the early 20th century, there wasn't really a hierarchy of forms. And in fact, there was a lot of mutability between forms, which is mm -hmm. to say that, you know, what some uh, practitioners were doing in textiles, they were exploring similar things that people were exploring in oil paint as well at the same time. Um, and so I didn't want to kind of stay with those, uh, those categories. And that's why I think I talk a lot about art practice to kind of open up the idea of what art is um, and who can be considered to be practicing as artists. Yeah, I think this is great. Oh, so I wanted to come to, before we I want to later come to sort of the textiles and, and all that stuff. So sure. your, your work, when you talk about, when I was reading your work, right, you, you start with this, um, this, uh, this artist, uh, Nicolas Saig, right, mm -hmm. um, who is working at the end of the 19th century, uh, was born in the second half of the 19th century, and working between the second half of the 19th century and the, and the first half of the 20th century. Yeah. Um, and in your piece, you write that many people consider him to be sort of like uh, this work, this particular work to be sort of the, the birth of modern art in Palestine. Yeah. Can you explain that? What is this work? What's the context around this work and why it was useful for you to talk about and why people think this is a meaningful piece? Yeah, so the, the first major um, kind of book publication that came out both in Arabic and in English about Palestinian art in the 20th century or art made by Palestinians throughout the 20th century um, was a book by uh, Kamal Bulata, who uh, died recently. Yeah. I'm sure many people on this call know. Um, and he really starts his narrative in the 20th century with Nicola Sayeg um, because he presents this kind of switch point between uh, someone who was trained uh, in the religious arts. He was trained as an icon painter um, in Palestine, and that's a really whole kind of fascinating history. But then around the turn of the 20th century, seems to start making canvases that are more in line with, uh, they're still sometimes about like religious scenes like this one here, a nativity scene, but it's more of a genre scene. Um, so he starts to kind of branch out or branch away from a purely uh, religious type of art practice or a practice that kind of happens within uh, 
a Christian organization and move to this type of work um, and move away from what had just been kind of one type of practice. And so he's seen as this transitional figure in many ways. And so he's always, uh, he fascinated Kamal Balata, he's fascinated other scholars since. Um, and I got engaged with his work because I was, I guess a little bit troubled by some of the ways that Bulata was talking about um, his work as being mm -hmm. kind of secular, first of all, which I find hard to say uh, on, in a painting like this. Yeah. Um, but also that it already presented some sort of Palestinian nationalism, um, which with all the reading I was doing at the time about kind of the, uh, cultural ethos or social ethos in Palestine in the early 20th century was not exactly the conversation. Um, they, that wasn't quite the fight yet, um, fighting for a nation state um, through you know, talking about a national identity. So I wanted to kind of take apart his argument just for the sake of curiosity and see if I could find other things that were going on in this painting. Um, yeah, and you found something. You found this like, <laughs> you found this interesting thing that yeah go, go ahead explain explain what this image is on the bottom right corner. uh sure yeah. so um so a lot so in kamal bulat's book and in other people's work who are writing about uh palestinian kind of painting from this period they always would say you know that painters were kind of copying or interested in uh photographic work that was going on at the same time but there had never been a concerted effort to figure out like what actually these painters may have been copying or may have yeah. been looking to just as aid memoir, um, kind of a photo photographic aid to help paint. Um, and I had already been engaged with the archives of the American Colony Photo Department, which I know we can talk about more about who they are later. Yeah. Um, but this was one of the kind of first uh, I, you know, I thought I had seen some similar work by the American Colony, photographic work they had done of, of famous religious paintings in, uh, in Palestine. And so I really started searching their archives to see if I could find um, evidence for what some artists were actually looking at at the time, what Palestinian painters were looking at. And indeed, I found um, this uh, dry plate negative that the American Colony had photographed itself. Yeah of another painting um, yeah. <laughs> and it's uh, a really long time to and a kind of a lot of good coincidences and chance meetings to actually locate this painting that was then photographed oh, which then okay so then. you just to do the to walk through this to make sure i'm clear yeah you came across this piece because kamal bulata wrote about it famously yeah. Then you were like, this must, there must be a reference. I have a feeling there's a reference. Mm -hmm. Then you came across this photo mm -hmm. and realized, wow, that's strikingly similar. Correct. <laughs> and this photo is of this painting. And then you went and found this painting. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Do you have any indication whether he, whether the artist even knew about this painting? Well, this, this painting, so luckily the American colony photograph this painting in a few different ways. So okay. the one we're seeing on the screen is kind of just the image of the painting. Yeah. But we actually have a, a few photographs they took of the painting wow. in its place, which was um, in the Church of the Nativity in, in Bethlehem, yeah. um, in that kind of underground space where you go to actually see where um, uh, where uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ was laying as a child and or as a baby. and um, and you see it hanging there. Um, and we don't have exact dates, but we know kind of in the first decades of the 20th century. Um, but then we didn't know what happened to that painting. Um, yeah. And it's not there and it doesn't hang there anymore. I knew that I had been to Bethlehem. I had, I had gone looking for it. And so I got in touch with the uh, the friars at the custody of the Holy Land, um, especially Fair Stefan, who's kind of in charge of their cultural patrimony. Mm -hmm. um, and he hadn't seen it either. Um, so this, it kind of, there was a whole like detective hunt to find oh, interesting. This painting. People had thought it was destroyed. Um, well, I, okay. I should, I should back up because actually one of the reasons I was able to find this painting is because I was at an exhibition in, uh, in Jerusalem and 
part of what was on view there was uh, a collection of mother of pearl carved um, shells um, okay. that are owned by this collector, George Alama. And I was at this exhibition and it was opening night. I'm looking at this collection and one of the shells is carved with this same painting. Oh, wow. On it. Cool. And it's from the 1980s. So weird. And so my mind like exploded and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I can't believe, you know, that first of all, people are still copying this painting. Palestinian uh, craftsmen are still copying this painting yeah. um, and that somebody else has access. And so I met George who owned this piece. I asked him about it, you know, did he know, he knew that it was referenced the Nicola Saig painting, um, but he had it's never like seen it. It's like a hip hop sample that keeps on getting sampled. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. And I was like, what makes this painting so yeah. relevant um, for expressing Palestinian culture to some degree, or why is it still so beloved? Um, and it was then, you know, George and I were on the hunt. I was in touch with the friars at the custody of the Holy Land and, Long story short, we finally found this painting hanging in the TV room um, <laughs> of the monastery um, in Bethlehem. And the first time I saw it was um, was hanging and uh, there was a, a friar a nap under it in the TV room. How bizarre. Okay, I wanna keep on going because you have so much All stuff to talk place. about. Yeah. Um, okay, so I wanna talk about, um, I'm, before we go, I'm gonna show other sort of remixed um, photos uh, or sort of uh, primary sources and remixed uh, mm -hmm. artwork that has sort of helped define this stage of early art. Yeah. This On this slide, I want to use this slide as an opportunity to talk about this mysterious department that was new to me at only uh, you introduced me this work, the American Colony Photo Department. Mm -hmm. I had, I've had i seen a lot of their work uh, just because of Africa. I'm constantly looking yeah. for stuff. Um, who are these people? What was this thing? Please explain. Yes. Um, so yeah, you're right. Pretty much any time you see a, a presentation on culture in the Arab world, you somebody will present um, some of the photographic work of the American Colony. Um, their images are pretty ubiquitous. They have a very rich archive and they're available. Most of the slides are available through the Library of Congress currently. Yep. And that's why they really make the rounds in such yeah. a uh, profound way. But the American colony themselves are really interesting. This was a group of um, Swedish Americans uh, who lived in Chicago in the 1880s. Um, and they were, you know, originally a group of Calvinists who decided to kind of branch off um, from the kind of main, uh, their main religious community in Chicago because of some matters of personal circumstance and decide to kind of start their own um, religious colony. Okay. In Chicago. So it's Swedish, it's mostly Swedish American immigrants in Chicago. But, and they was... They, photography like essential to their work was Palestine not, not, essential not at to all. Their they work? are not photographers at this point um, they are okay. lawyers school teachers all of those things but they come to Jerusalem in 18 uh, 1881 okay. um, because they believe it's got that year the coming of the Messiah the Messiah is going to come the second coming okay um, due to you know some belief and somebody does some geometric work figuring out what the pyramids are saying to them and 1881 is going to be the moment. Spoiler uh, alert: He did not come. <laughs> right. So they get to they get to Jerusalem. It's a group of about 30 people, um, kids and adults. And yeah, spoiler alert: He doesn't arrive. Then they rework the numbers. Um, they think he's going to come a few years later. That also doesn't happen. And so in the meantime, we have this group of Swedish Americans living in Jerusalem that need to find a way to um, get by, to make money, to prosper. Interestingly, they weren't missionaries. They were not interested in converting people um, and they were not supported by any major denomination or any kind of nation. So they were really unique in Jerusalem in this moment for that reason. Um, so they start a lot of other things. Um, they rent this very large um, house now um, on, on Nablus Road, kind of that's that border between what we think of today as East and West Jerusalem. Uh, they start a hostel, they start a bakery, 
um, they're su super industrious um, and they have an influx of Swedish immigrants that come and join them in the 1890s, which really helps uh, kind of their, their numbers so they can kind of have stronger industry. And in the 1890s, one of the people who joins them, this rather mysterious figure from India, who seemed to be a, uh, grew up in India, was a Jew, converts to Christianity and learns photography on the way, okay. <laughs> teaches photography um, to members of the American colony and they start a photographic department. And they grow to become one of the largest um, photo commercial photographic departments in the, uh, in the region, pretty much from 1900 to 1930 or so, when a schism within the colony uh, breaks it up a bit. Um, wow. And they photograph just about everything. Um, so they have this really, really rich archive, and they're a totally fascinating group. So um, just to make the connection, those on the call, why are these people important to you? Aside from, uh, why is this this group important to you for understanding both, uh, you know, art in Palestine, but also Palestinian art? Yeah, um, they. I mean, first, of course, I was looking at them just because of the wealth of the photographic archive. Yeah. Um, if you want to learn about what was going on in Palestine in these years, that's just one of the best places to look, right? Sure. Um, because they have records of so many of the activities of what was happening. But once I started to make the connection, you know, the, their photographic work circulated as um, picture postcards, especially. They also did a lot of kind of um, more um, impressive, expensive work, printing their photographs, hand coloring them in really beautiful ways, um, selling them as souvenirs. So their work was circulating a lot. and in its own time as it is now. Um, and so once I started to make the connection um, and this connection uh, between yeah. these two photographs was um, already known uh, by Kamal Bulata, um and many others. And so we knew that he had used their photographs as the source for one of his paintings, this kind of very clearly, a painting that was clearly about a, a particular political moment. But once I discovered that he was using their photographs for other paintings as well, I started to think about these conversations, um, visual conversations, we could say, that were happening between different um, artisans, craftspeople in Palestine at the moment that we don't have textual records of. You know, I, I can't point to a letter that says, or a document yeah. I have yet to find that Nicola Saig was hanging out at the American colony, even though they, they hosted a lot of events, they really were a kind of cultural salon and hub in their own time, but mm -hmm. through the work that he produces um, and knowing that his studio and their souvenir shop were, you know, a five minute walk from each other, you knew that they were in dialogue to some degree. And so a lot of my work has been to figure out what, what was that dialogue about? Um, why was Sayag drawn to their particular form of photographic work? Um, was it just because it was so ubiquitous or was there something else going on there? Yeah, I've there's been, something There's yeah. something like really, we talked about this briefly uh, uh, before we started about, yeah. there's something like recur recursive about this, right? Um, that Palestinian artist is understanding uh, the place and the, the moments in time and the places that they inhabit themselves through this foreign lens, right? Quite literally a foreign lens. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that question of foreignness is, is really interesting to me at this time. Yeah, you know, the American yeah, colonists, yes, they're, for, they're, they're foreigners, but, you know, they get there in 1880. There's plenty of their members are born there and raised there. Many of their um, most prominent photographers were either uh, born in Jerusalem or uh, grew up there from like under the age of five. Mm -hmm. um, and they know the city really well and they speak Arabic and they speak, you know, they they're very entrenched in the community. And so, you know, part of this, um, this recursiveness that you're talking about goes back to what I was saying earlier about the fact that I don't really see that there was a real hierarchy between different media at this time. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of kind of borrowing back and forth between media. And that's how you get a painting, you know, that's photographed, repainted, carved into mother of pearl, all, you know, and that's all kind of fine. Um, 
and what I found in my research was that I think that that ethos or that ability to go between media had a lot to do with this very robust religious souvenir market uh, in Palestine uh, up until uh, uh, really up until the end of, you know, until about 1936. Um, that kind of encouraged this kind of art making and borrowing and riffing yeah. and riffing on stuff that worked, you know, riffing on things that people would buy. Um, and that's a huge, a huge part of it is really considering the, the art or the kind of the market for this work and why it was circulating the way it was. Yeah. So I want to talk before we get into the, the questions. Um, and again, anyone in the chat who wants to ask questions, you can type them there. Um, so moving into the sort of the 20th century, yeah, approaching the the 1940s, in your in your dissertation, you talk you talk about some of the other sort of um, uh, maybe institutions is, is the right word um, complexes mm -hmm. that exist. You know, um, the the colony is one of them. Uh, you know. You talk about the Supreme uh, Muslim Council, but you also talk about these other institutions that are initiated. Like um, one of them, this idea of the you know the the National Arab Fair in the nineteen thirty in nineteen thirty three in the Palestinian Folk Museum. Um, yeah. So in the early thirties, what did people think Arab of uh, Palestinian art was locally? What were they hoping to sort of uh, codify into being by having these institutions that were you know, <laughs> in charge of actually pro being proponents of it. So yeah. yeah, walk me through that moment in time. What, yeah. what was that? I, I, first of all, I just, I really love this question because that is my guiding question um, right. of this research, right? Which is what, what did it mean to be an artist in Palestine yeah. in the 1920s and 1930s? Who was considered an artist? Um, would they even call themselves artists, right? There were these, these are my big questions. Um, and I still think I'm, ex I really still feel like I'm exploring those, those answers. Um, because to my mind, a lot of the production that I was seeing this, or these art practices that were happening before about this time, about the 1930s, I'm not sure um, people were necessarily thinking them, of themselves as, yeah, capital A artists. Um, mm -hmm. It was a kind of the productive industry. Um, you could make money off of doing this work, um, which is not to say that it wasn't good work. I want to be kind of clear about that or that it wasn't interesting in its own right. But there weren't institutions um, in Palestine at this time that were devoted to the study of art exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, in the French colonies at this point, we have Ecole de Beaux Arts, we have Beaux Arts setups, we have institutions for artisanal work as well, where people go and study to be artists. But the British um, who were occupying Palestine at this time didn't set up those kind of institutions. There were some attempts and some kind of uh, flaky or failed attempts, one of them being this Palestine Folk Museum, another being the Pro Jerusalem Society but no real art schools as such. The only major art school was the Betzalel uh, School, which was established by Zionists um, in 1906 in Jerusalem and a place where um, Palestine's, Palestinians were not exactly welcome yet. Um, so that kind of led me to look at these other kinds of institutions, like thinking about trade fairs, um, where mm -hmm. we have the display of handicrafts and industry um, and kind of uh, understand art's role in um, in these uh, calls for um, kind of uh, stimulating the economy and using the economy to argue for uh, the value or relevance of a Palestinian nation. So in this case, um, this is the first National Arab Fair in 1933. You're seeing the um, people clamoring to get into uh, the building and you're seeing the floor plans of the fair on the right there. And to me, it's so interesting that we have um, what we now consider to be some of, right, these kind of grandfathers, grandmothers of modern Palestinian art. We have their paintings on view here um, next to embroidery work, next to um, perfumes, next to leather goods, um, as though they're all equally constitutive mm -hmm. of uh, the productivity of um, Palestinians at this time. So it's kind of getting off, like 
you know, trying to kind of get off my high horse about what constitutes capital A art and see it as contributing to these other um, forces in that in that time. Yeah. So <laughs> that was clear. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. I want to talk uh, briefly, and then I want to go into the questions about um, about costume. Right. First of all, I love the word costume. Um, as opposed to clothing. Um, so you include this quote in your text. Um, and so I'll read it for those uh, who can't see the screen. So with all the talk one hears about nationality and the rights of minorities, one would have thought that the co that costume would be treasured as a national heritage. But however strong national politics may be, they do not include many of those characteristics, costume among the most important, which are vital to the individuality of a people. Um, that was said by W.A. Stewart, 1932. Who was W.A. Stewart and why did you think that was worth including? Um, so Stewart is, um, was someone who was appointed by the British mandate government to be the director of education um, in the 1930s. And mm -hmm. he uh, had spent a lot of time in Egypt just before this, actually working there at the School of Fine Arts and Crafts. Mm -hmm. um, and he was trained and kind of brought up in uh, the British kind of through the British arts and crafts movement yeah. um, in the early 20th century, which had a real interest in recapturing uh, traditional forms of craftsmanship as a basis for producing kind of new nationalized art forms. And so people like Stuart, um, he wasn't the only one in uh, Palestine or part of the British mandate government that was interested in this, but, um, they were kind of, they saw Palestine as this really great blank slate, <laughs> um, which was, it was not, of course, but as a place to kind of try out their theories of um, pulling out these traditional uh, crafts and also clothing costumes and trying to promote them as a way of forming some sort of um, kind of national branding of, uh, of the community. Um, it's hard for me, you know, people like Stuart are really tough because I think they had many uh, decent intentions um, and they did a lot to kind of try and preserve and revive um, certain traditions and crafts. But of course their work was often um, undermining the actual agency of the people kind of and how they were wanted to move forward and wanted to create new things. So, you know, Stuart, yeah wasn't a fan, you know, at this time we have all these new kind of imported European embroidery threads coming into Palestine and he's very anxious about that and wanting to like preserve what was traditional. But at the same time, he recognized that one of the best and most um, expressive art forms in Palestine at the time was Tatris, was embroidery yeah. work. Um, and I kind of do commend him for that. Yeah, okay, great. Um so I could talk to you for a long, long time. So I'm just gonna mention that you also talk about three different other artists. Um, maybe we'll have time at the end to come back to them. Um, al Saidi, uh, Badran and Halabi. Um, hmm. And so I think we'll come back at the end if we have time, but let's move on to the quick Q&A and then open things up to everybody else. Okay. So first, what are you reading or watching right now? You know, this one's like too embarrassing because I'm just trying to no watch. Judgment. I'm just trying to watch things that like feel like heavy blankets um, at the stress of the current moment. So like my real answer is, you know, I've been rewatching the Gilmore Girls, which is- uh, Oh my God, so good. It's good. It like takes part of your brain. But I would say like the last great thing I just read was um, Exit West by Mohsin Hamid, um, okay. which was incredible incredible and you know you were talking earlier about how long my dissertation is this book is short there's such a good economy of language in it okay. um he's talking about kind of these these two people that fall in love and have to become refugees um and they move as they move all around the world so it's 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 it was beautiful and so economically written which i'm always i think like salivating over <laughs> okay cool that's a great one um let's say um who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Um, I don't know exactly shadow, but I something I'm very sad about is that I never had the chance to meet Kamal Bulada before he passed. Um, mm. And I feel like my work will be in dialogue with his for the rest of my life. Um, I'm going to continue the conversation with 
like him and everything that he put forward. Um, as the did public. you ever email? Um, we did. No, we did not. Um, it was really, oh, my yeah, God. it's how heartbreaking it is heartbreaking. I had, I think a very misguided idea that I, I really needed to kind of set out what my own stakes were in this project and my own thoughts. Um, and so I had always planned that pretty much like the minute the dissertation went in, I would get in touch. Um, and I, I waited too long and I'm really sad about that, but I hope um, yeah, I will be continuing the conversation that he started and I, you know, I wish I could spend a day with him. Well, there, I think there's a lesson to learn there, right? Absolutely. Which is just Absolutely. tell people you admire that you admire them. Absolutely. Without, without like expectation of them being like, I admire you back. <laughs> yeah, which they definitely don't do when you're a young PhD student. You know, it's all about yeah. listening to other people. And I, I learned so many lessons from his work. So yeah, it's, it was a, it's a good lesson for sure. Okay. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work or your line of work? Mm. Um, oh, interesting. Um, I think about my work, you mentioned this like when we were talking earlier, like did I come at this project through a political lens or did I come at it through like a cultural social lens? And the real answer is, is neither of those. Um, I was interested in this question about institutions and how institutions and social networks, like how we can witness those things in the artwork themselves mm -hmm. um, and how institutions mediate form and looking at that question through this, what is a really complicated situation in Palestine in the early 20th century was just such a rich um, place. And of course, I'm very interested now in, in the, the social and political aspects, of course, but um, it didn't exactly start there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um... Whose work do you admire or are inspired by? Let's remove. Uh, yes, Bilal we'll Tukumi. remove him. Um, you know, I um, I teach um, classes on Islamic art and architecture, and I have to say that I continue to be inspired by the work of uh, Oleg Grabar, who was kind of a giant in the field of Islamic art and architecture in the U.S. Um, and abroad, but he he taught at Harvard. Um, and he just, he's, he's written so many awesome short texts that start with questions. Um, and I really aspire to do that as well. The way he writes is it's around a question. He allows you to like think with him and he doesn't always have the answers. And I really appreciate that about his work. He was such, he had such a broad range of understanding of the field, but he always wrote as though he was a novice um, and would often write before he had all the answers, he would say. Are you typically attracted to like the medium, like how things are done as opposed to like what they are? Um, I'm, I'm attracted, well, I'm, I feel like I'm attracted to the question of like why things exist. Okay. <laughs> right, like I was curious with the, the Nicola Saeed stuff, it's like why does this work exist and why is it so exciting to people um, still now? Or uh, the research I'm doing right now has to do with this question of you know, of all the painted work in Palestine in the early 20th century, like none of it really um, obviously comments on all the political situation that was going on there. Well, the poets were doing lots of that. They were really very clearly talking about the changes to um, the Palestinian world in the early 20th century. So my question is, right, like, why do we have all these bucolic landscape paintings from this yeah. time? Um, so I don't know. Yeah, it's the, so, the, why does it exist in the first place? <laughs> so um, how did that change um, as like people um, type in questions? I guess my my question to you is every everything I've read of yours and every, I've uh, other in talking to you now, mm -hmm. there's always this idea of this is pre Nakba, this is pre nineteen forty eight, mm -hmm. right? There's this asterisk. Oh, by the way, this is pre nineteen forty eight. But like that line in the sand doesn't exist, you know, um, for for everyone, right? There are people yeah. who live beyond that and work beyond that. Mm -hmm. How is how did people, artists who were working beyond that and sort of recrafting this image of Palestine and and nationalism there and a right to be recognized and a right to be um, to exist? Mm -hmm. um, how did they look at this sort of pre-1948 work? Was it discarded as a, ugh, that, that's when we were just like 
um, making pictures of landscapes. <laughs> like, it's interesting. I feel like it's been the opposite, actually. Okay. Um, yeah. Like with the way that Bulada was interpreting the Nicola Saig work as like expressing a very um, clear nationalism. Um, yeah. Same thing, like you had a painting up earlier of uh, or watercolor by Sophie Halaby of a thistle of a of a, a Syrian thistle. Yeah. Um, and that work, people did did see it. She was displaying this work after forty eight. Um, she was still alive into the eighties. Um, and so what I found interesting is people kind of, again, recap capturing that work as a very specific like expression of Palestinianness. And I think a lot of my work has been to try and um, nuance other um, things that this work was expressing um, in order to kind of allow it to breathe a little bit more and, um, and to have kind of more dimensionality than the way that maybe it was instrumentalized at least immediately after 48. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to get out of the way. So we have two questions so far, Ula and Yaz. So let's start with Ula. If you want to unmute yourself, you can ask your question. And then Yaz, uh, if you want to be up next, that would be great. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this um, enlightening about the uh, different media of art. I would like to ask, uh, when you visited the Palestinian culture in Jerusalem or the area there, did you find any uh, new uh, medias of art, uh, art uh, practicing, like you said, uh, that was specific or new that surprised you there? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, there's so, I don't know, like it surprised me, um, some of the work that I found, some, the, um, some objects that I'm really interested in right now, are these beautiful souvenir booklets of pressed uh, wildflowers from the region, um, specifically uh, wildflowers that were mentioned in the Bible. Um, but, and you know, so there are pressed flower souvenirs all over the world, but I'm, I was really interested in these ones that were created by people in Palestine, um, both for personal reasons, and then also ones that were created for the souvenir market um, because they're really nice, um, kind of packets of all different types of craft work coming together. So usually the, um, the covers are carved olive wood. Sometimes there's mother of pearl inlay in them. Um, they're bound in uh, leather or sometimes uh, some kind of soft sheepskin in the binding. And then these great, um, it's not just that they're pressed flowers, but they're put into these compositions to express the place from which they were taken. So like, um, uh, if the flowers were taken from the area around Rachel's tomb, um, the flowers themselves as they're pressed kind of look like um, somebody who's been laid down to rest and, and people watching over them. So there's this really expressive quality that they were doing with dried flowers and stems and twigs. Um, and I'm interested in how those souvenir books were then seen and maybe interpreted in painted work as well. When people went to paint Palestinian wildflowers, they kind of used the the aesthetics of those pressed flower books. Cool. Thanks, Ula. Um, Yaz, you're up. I will read your question, if that's okay with you. What do you think of art institutions in Palestine uh, in these times? How do you see their role in the current uh, in current art practices? Mm. Um that's really where I started, you know, when I was looking at Al Mamel and what they were doing. Um, and of course, there are many other really fantastic organizations in Palestine now. Um, I think they're doing a lot of the similar work that I am, I have to say, um, just through a different method. Um, so much, I feel like, of what the current art institutions are doing in Palestine are to help open up some more of the research and more archives and make that available to contemporary artists um, to use for their own practices or to use for kind of their own um, thinking and intellection. And I've been really interested in, in those aspects of their work. Um, because a lot of what, some, not, not exclusively, but a lot of contemporary Palestinian artists are also looking at the same time period that I am and kind of trying to understand and trace these artistic roots um, and how their own work intersects with that. And so I've been really inspired by how institutions in Palestine have been part of that work. Um, have been interested in, um, in exposing some of these histories and archives to Palestinian artists uh, to work from. Cool. Yeah. 
Great. Um, okay, the last question so far, is, I'm going to ask, because um, yeah. his microphone's not working. Um, rediscovered or otherwise, what art have you most marveled at being in the presence of? Oh, um, most marveled. Please tell me it's the mother of pearl tiny thing that you found. That was amazing. That was like an amazing, <laughs> it was, that was an amazing day because not only was it like what I had been looking, you know, thinking about how an image translates between media to like see it there, but then also to see that it was made in 1980, which kind of gets to my thesis about, you know, the fact that this artwork does span that 1948 moment. It does live on past 48. So, so that was a big one. It's like this Indiana Jones. <laughs> it was, I felt like such a, <laughs> um, so that, but the other thing, if I want to give like one extra, like cool, yeah cool items that I was looking at um, have to be these hand-painted photographic albums that were produced by the American colony um, where they would take like a passages from the Bible. Um, yeah, print them, uh, print the passages kind of on opposing pages and layouts with photographs they had taken that then they hand colored. Um, mm, I don't have them. And they're just, they're, they're so, yeah, they're so exquisite. Um, in person, they're really hard to photograph, but I've now seen quite a bit of hand-painted photographic work and I rarely encountered um, items that are as precise and kind of uh, in technicolor in the way that the ones that the American colony produced are. And we still don't know who exactly was responsible for the painting um, of, those, of those works. I mean, they were, they operated as a collective, but, but those, seeing those was, uh, I marveled for sure. So cool. Okay, uh, Soha, you're going to be our last question. Do you want to yeah. unmute yourself? Hi, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering because we talked about um, the, you know, pre nakba period. Are there any artists um, that maybe you could tell us about that we could look into further from the transitional period um, from the end of the Ottoman Empire, the post nakba period? Thank you. So, are you, sorry, Suha, are you more interested in hearing about artists from before the Nakba or after? I didn't quite understand. Sorry, that was after. Oh, for after, yeah. yeah. Sure, I mean, there are really, um, there are a couple books I'd recommend for you to look at. Um, so Kamal Bulada's book on Palestinian art does go into the more um, co contemporary or at least into the kind of 80s and 90s. Um, uh, Bashir Mahul and Gordon Hon have recently released a book called The Origins of Palestinian Art, and they look at quite a lot of uh, contemporary work that you might be interested in. Um, and uh, I'm just trying to think of other, you know, the good resources. Um, and the other place I would look is at some of the um, websites of these art institutions that are operating in Palestine now. So like Al Mamal, um, Al Hosh. Gallery in Jerusalem is great. Dar Jasser in Bethlehem, uh, just opened by two prominent Palestinian artists and filmmakers, Emily um, Jasser and Anne Marie Jasser. Um, and it, looking at their websites and their activities and which artists they've hosted will give you a really good sense of who is um, doing a lot of great work today among Palestinian artists. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Thank you so much. Thanks, Soha. Um, well, Nisa, thank you so much for, for joining. This was really, really wonderful. I'm just going to ask everybody on the call to please, uh, you can follow Nisa. Uh, you can find her online. If you just search her name, you'll find her information. Very easy person to uh, reach out to. Um, if you're interested in her work, you can find it on there as well. Um, please give us feedback. Uh, it's one question and the question is, was this good? Uh, the link is in the chat. Please, please answer. It helps us do better. Um, and if you love the work we're doing and you want to create a more curious and compassionate uh, region filled with brilliant and friendly nerds like you, uh, please support our work and keep everything we do free and open to all. Um, the link is also in the chat. Okay, cool. This was fun. Thanks for letting me join the, the nerd mafia. I really yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> It was super fun. I feel at home here. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for everything you're doing. Thanks much. Bye guys. Bye everyone. Stay safe. Bye.